Hello, and welcome to the Margin Outlook and Strategies to Consider seminar. My name is Rachel Zumba, and I just have a few reminders for before we start. Um, please complete the evaluation form that's on your table, um, and there is also a raffle card that you can get a stamp from me at the end of the seminar. Tim Hughes is a member of the CIH management team and oversees a group that helps hog producers identify margin op opportunities and manage risk. He joined the firm in 2013 with 18 years of experience in the industry. For 10 years, he traded commodities, currencies, bonds, and equity indexes independently for a select group of clients using mechanical trading systems he designed and developed. Previously, he spent eight years tra trading delta neutral volatility strategies in the S&P 100 index options pit of the Chicago Board Options Exchange. Tim holds a BS or a Bachelor's of Science degree in finance from the University of Illinois and a Series 3 Commodities Future Examination License. Please help us welcome Tim Hughes. Hey everybody. Uh, like Rachel said, my name is Tim Hughes. I am from Chicago, Illinois. Um, I work with a firm called CIH, which stands for Commodity and Ingredient Hedging uh, out of Chicago. Uh, we've been in risk management since 1999. So, um, this is some pretty dry material, I'm sure, for some of you. Risk management is like uh, uh, fingernails on a, on a chalkboard. So with such a small group, I really appreciate everyone that's hung out uh, with the weather and everything else. But with a real small group, you know, there's no reason to wait till the end for questions. If anyone has a question during it, just raise your hand and we'll get to it right away. I'd prefer that actually uh, be more timely. So. So today we're going to take a look at uh, the current margin structure. Uh, we'll take a look at fundamentals. Uh, I won't go too deep into the fundamentals just because you, uh, Dr. Steve Meyer had a good talk yesterday on those. And um, we'll take a look at global scene with China, ASF, uh, Europe, prices, exports, and whatnot. We'll take a look at the, what I call the market structure. So things like cutout, uh, the CME index, uh, futures, and things of that nature. Take a look at where margins are currently today. Uh, we're going to focus on the third quarter just because it's the six month out uh, quarter at this point in time. And then we'll take a look at a strategy that we think uh, makes a lot of sense based on the current uh, prices out there in the, in the market. So as far as, as, far as fundamentals are concerned, um, as you all know, you know we, we've had a, a massive amount of production here in the last couple of years, and it, it's going to continue in 2020, it, it seems. Most projections are for a continued expansion in 2020. If you look at historical hog slaughter, uh, most of the charts I'm going to show you are these stacked charts. So you're going to have each year is, is, uh, is a different line on these charts. So the blue line would be 2020. The red line is 2019 on most of these charts. You know, but you can see last year how just how much uh, higher slaughter was compared to the year prior. We've already started out this year having a week up 7% and a week up about 5%. So we're, we're continuing to see extremely large expansion even here early in 2020. The problem, of course, is the weights continue to be cumbersome as well. Um, albeit in the last week or so, weights have come down from their record high of about 217 and change down to below 216. And you can still see that in the last five years, weights are at a significant high um, and they remain there. When you look at last week's slaughter, it was curtailed due to weather this week, maybe a little bit as well. So you, you gotta wonder if these weights are gonna continue to come down the way, th the way they did last week. And weights are a big factor in this, right? Because if you're a processor and you're out there bidding for pigs, one thing you're gonna look at is how many available pigs are out there. And as you can see, weights this high would indicate that there's plenty of, rock, of market ready hogs ready to head to the processor. So when you add all that up, 2019 project production was up 5%. 2020 is already projected to be up another 3.6% or a billion pounds. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. But we'll take a look at that 2020 production. Okay, so the, the, the peach line here, that's 2019 production. The 1 billion pounds additional in 2020, or 3.6% higher, would be that dotted line on top of it. Just to give you some sense of, if you, if you take that projected production and then break it down seasonally, what it looks like on a chart. 
So we're going to continue to have massive expansion in 2020 unless there's some sort of health issue that intertwines. Another interesting thing I thought would, would bear some attention would be where pork is currently priced relative to poultry and beef, you know, the competing proteins. You know, back in October when cutout was, was on its highs, you know, pork was, as measured by pork cutout, was about 113% of poultry prices as measured by the National Composite Whole Bird. You can see how that's dropped here recently. You know, but look at that red line. Red line is 2019 when we were about 69% of the National Composite Whole Bird. We're starting out this year in a much more expensive relative spot to last year when it comes to competing proteins. The same can be said versus beef. You know, so if you look at pork cutout versus select beef cutout, you know, last year at this point in time we were 33% of select beef, and at this point in time we're 37%. So that's one thing to consider when you're looking at domestic demand is how that could impact uh, demand early in 2020. Taking a look at the global pork scene, of course, and, and ASF in general, uh, we won't, again, do too, di too deep of a dive here. But this gives you some indication. This is from Index Mundi, which is a great site. And, and they show you uh, 2019 pork consumption, okay? The red boxes will be the countries that currently have ASF in their, in their production, okay? Now, the EU, as a caveat, the EU is listed here as a country, but the EU certainly does, as you're going to see in the next slide. But the thing is, 83%, if you add up the top 10 pork-consuming countries, 83% of that pork is currently in countries that are ASF positive. This news just hit overnight. Um, as most of you probably know, ASF has been in Poland uh, for a few years now. It recently, in the fall, jumped over to Western Poland, which is right next to Germany, which is, Germany is one of the top three suppliers of pork to China, right? Well, overnight, this is what I woke up to this morning, is African swine fever jumped even closer to Germany yesterday. They found a wild boar just 12 kilometers or 8 miles from the German border. And that would be that dot right there. You know, now they've done an incredible job in Belgium of containing the wild boars, right? They haven't been able to spread over to France or over to Germany from that spot in Belgium that has it. But this, you could wake up any day and Germany could have ASF uh, without, without a doubt, right? They, they've been moving steadily over the last few months through those forests uh, between Poland and, and uh, Germany. And if that, were the, if that were the case, of course, Germany's exports would initially be cut off. And they, again, they are a top three supplier of pork to China. So that, that's one thing that could impact the U.S. favorably here in the very near future if they're not successful of holding those wild boars back. This is a few months old. Uh, I still like showing it, though, uh, just, just to uh, emphasize the risk that's out there for ASF entering the United States. So this is just an article from Australia. And in Australia, they conducted a, a survey. They sampled 418 pork products that were confiscated in six different airports. 202 of those products tested positive for ASF. Okay? Now, you've heard stories, and, and we're continuing to see stories of pork confiscated in American ex, uh, airports as well. Just to give you, just to keep on top of this as far as the risk is concerned for ASF entering this country. Checking in on China prices, uh, they have come off their highs, okay? So Chinese wean pig price, they call it their piglet price. Um, over here in 2020, you can see it's at 93 half. It topped out right at 100 won per kilogram. Chinese hog prices have come down as well from their highs of over 40 won per kilogram down to about 37. They have risen here in the last couple weeks ahead of the lunar holiday, which starts on the 25th in a couple days. Interesting to see Chinese broiler prices right now, okay? So it, if you can't see it very well, it's, it's, this, it's this line right here in 2020. Chinese broiler prices are down to 6.56 won per kilogram. That's the second cheapest they've been at this time of year in the last five years. You know, you, you would think that the pork price and all of that would bleed over into their broiler price. 
you know, but Chinese broiler production was actually up 15% last year. And so they're trying to ramp up their, tr their broiler production in order to make up some of the deficit on the pork side of things. A couple warnings about China, okay? Um, a lot of people are, are working under the hypothesis that China is going to take at least two to three years to rebuild their pork production, right? But with the massive margins that are available, there are people out there in China, and JCI is this consulting firm and is one of them, saying that it's going to happen quicker than that. Now, it's all going to depend on the new population of pigs and whether or not they can, are successful in keeping ASF out of the barns, right? But with the money that's there, there's hedge funds chasing this, there, there are biotech, or there's technology companies chasing this, and it's very possible, it's very possible that you're going to see a ramp up in production in China quicker than what most of us assume. Um, in fact, December slaughter in China was 14% higher than, than November. So they've already started to hit that bottom as far as production is concerned. The other thing is this developing story about the new coronavirus in China. Um, I did go back this morning and looked at how uh, SARS, SARS impacted uh, consumption in China, and it was a pretty ugly story. Uh, SARS hit China in the fall of 2002, okay? And their consumption dropped significantly by the second quarter of 2003. Um, one thing that happens over there is the, the, the fear of the wet markets and everything like that impacts the consumption of protein in this type of situation. And this does seem to be a very rapidly uh, growing story over there and something to keep your eyes on. Uh, switching over to the EU, uh, one question that we get a lot at CIH is, you know, why are EU prices rallying so significantly while U.S. prices are so cheap, right, on hog prices? So this is the EU price. Uh, EU, the, the, the dotted line here would be the average carcass price in Europe for the last five years. And that blue line would be last year. You know, so even as, though, even as they have the same seasonality as we do heading into the fall, their prices continue to set record highs all the way into the end of the year. Now, they have dropped a little bit here to start the new year, but that's quite a different story than what we're seeing here in the United States, right? And the reason for that, and I know this is going to be hard to read on these screens, but the EU, the, the left chart here is EU production since 1999. You can see it, they've barely increased production since 1999, okay? Whereas look at their exports since 1999. The U.S. exports, everyone is screaming for more exports. The U.S. exports are doing fantastic. That, that chart down here on the bottom right are U.S. exports, and the 1999 time frame starts right where that red line is, okay? The big difference between these two, the Europe and the U.S., of course, is production, right? U.S. production is up almost 50% since, since 1999 a much different story than in Europe. You know, so it's no surprise that when you look at the Europe, which is the red line here, versus U.S. hog prices, it's the biggest gap since 2015 at least. Looking at U.S. exports, uh, U.S. exports were fantastic in 2019. There, there were a couple caveats to that, as we'll get into. But November exports alone were 623 million pounds, or 21 percent above 2018. And as a percentage of production, and this is a big stat that everyone needs to pay attention to, you know, the, the more production we have, the bigger percentage of it you need to move in order to stay constant as far as U.S. domestic consumption, right? So in, in November, we were at 26 percent versus 21.9 percent last year. Chinese exports, of course, taking off uh, earlier this year in, in November, setting a record. The problem out there has been, and the difference between this year and last year, is the situation we are in with Japan and Mexico, right? Japan's exports last year through November were 75 million pounds or so less than the previous year. Mexico's, Mexico exports to Mexico last year were 220 million pounds below a year ago. You know, those two countries, we performed terribly to them last year relative to a year ago when it comes to exports. Of course, we are in a much better situation now than we were last year at the same time, right? We've got the USMCA that's being ratified by Congress. We've got uh, 
uh, a bilateral trade agreement with Japan in place that we didn't have last year that should give us equal access to Canada as Canada and Europe into Japan. So both of those should help out significantly in 2020. However, you know, it, it, when you look at the balance sheet, okay, production is this left red box, exports are the middle red, red box, and per capita consumption in the U.S. is the right. And this is straight off the WASD from January, okay? The USDA right now is projecting exports in 2020 to be 13% higher than a year ago, while production's up 3.6%. You know, that's the type of ratio that you need, right? You, if, export, if, if production goes up 4%, you should be up four times that on exports just in order to stay even. The problem would be that you know, the, the USDA is projecting exports to go from 6.3 billion pounds in, in 19 to 7.1 billion pounds in 2020. A huge increase, okay? And now the, the Chinese trade deal, the phase one deal, if you start breaking down the numbers on what $1.7 billion of pork exports would look like, it would increase exports to China by about 200 or 300 million pounds, okay? If you get Mexico back to 2018 levels, that's another 225 million pounds. If you get Japan back to 2018 levels, it's 75. You add all that up and you're about 600 million pounds higher, right, in 2020 than 19. USDA is projecting these things to be up 800 million pounds. So even in all those scenarios, you still need to find a home for 200 million pounds. Any questions on that? I'm going through a lot of numbers real quick, but any questions so far at all? Yes, sir. Which was what? That's a great question. I mean, they're obviously expecting a higher increase to China, right, than what is in the trade deal. Now, this is the January WASD, right? So it had not come out yet when the trade deal phase one was announced. You, you got to think, and this is just opinion, right? But you got to think that the that there's no reason for China to come out and say we're going to get we're going to buy three billion dollars worth, right? It, all that would do is increase prices, right? So you got to think they're, for lack of a better word, sandbagging it a little bit, right? Downplaying a little bit, and that's what I do think is, is in there. I, I'm hoping that China buys more than 1.7 billion, considering that last year through November they'd already bought 1.2 billion. Does that answer your question? So taking a look at market structure as we start driving down the road towards margins and strategies, uh, it's a good idea to get a look at, at where we currently reside as far as the different uh, indices are concerned. And one thing I do want to dive into a little bit is cutout in, in some detail. Um, there are a lot more people out there that are getting their pigs priced off some portion of cutout, right? So it's important that you do understand exactly what cutout is comprised of. But looking at cutout in general, uh, cutouts had a good year so far in 2020. We've rallied up from about 72 or 73 up to $78. Um, we are now sitting about $10 above where we were last year at the same time, okay? One thing to keep in mind is that would you, what we all consider cutout, what we all consider cutout is negotiated cutout, okay? That's the 602 report that comes out on a daily basis. They do aggregate that 602 report into what's called a 610 weekly report, okay? That's only about 25% of pork sales. So the cutout that you all and, and I do, we all call cutout, that's only about 25% of pork sales, okay? You also have what's, form, what's called formula cutout, and that's a 620 report on the weekly report, okay? That's about 50 to 55% of pork sales. Just like on hogs, how most of your hogs are priced off of formula rather than on cash negotiated, right? And then a couple interesting reports on the cutout would be what they call the forward sales. So forward are just like negotiated, but for delivery beyond 14 days. And then most importantly, what I want to get into here would be the export cutout report, okay? 
a lot of people don't even, are not even aware of this report, and it's something that we've been watching really closely and has given us some indication as to the activity of China. Okay? A caveat on the export cutout report, a couple of them, is are that they, those, two, those three reports, the last three reports, the, the formula, the forward, and the export, do not include sales to Mexico or Canada. And none of the cutouts, none of the cutout reports include carcasses. Okay, it's all primal cuts and variety meats, and, and none of it includes carcasses. That's the breakdown that I was going over a little bit earlier uh, of the different cutout reports and the percentage that each comprises of the overall total. So the red line there is, is the formula sales, which is about 55% of sales. The blue line is negotiated, which is about 25%, and then forward as well as export sales make up about 12.5% each. So why doesn't that include Mexico and Canada sales? Is Chris Summers in the room? Chris is not, but... You want to feel that? I, I have an idea, but you want to feel that one? Yeah. Um, you want to use this microphone? That way. Can everybody hear me? It just records you for their recording. Okay. So, Mexico and Canada is in the negotiated section and is in the formula and anything that goes over the water is on the export. Right. That's the only stuff that goes into the export report. Anything that was NAFTA, so Mexico and Canada, is on the other three reports. Right. And, and what he's asking is why is it? Is it because of a pricing point? Is, is more similar to a When US? they did the negotiated rulemaking when they brought mandatory pork sales to reporting, they wanted the NAFTA trades included in the negotiated numbers. So that's why those are there. Uh, the FOB, price, it's pretty similar. There's a little bit more freight obviously going for to Mexico and Canada than anything within the states, but right. obviously there's going to be more freight going over the water. So the, the, the bottom line is that the export report does not include Mexico and Canada or carcasses. None of the cutout reports include carcasses. Thank you. So if you add up those four weekly reports, okay, and then take them as a percentage of the weekly pork production, this gave us a clue back in October that there was some pretty heavy activity as far as sales go, right? So the percentage, which typically is around 45%, Okay, so if you add up those four reports and divide it by the weekly production, it's typically around 45%. That number jumped to 60% one week in October, and the other weeks in October were very high as well. And then those numbers fell, right, down to about 40%, which is actually a record low for that metric in November and December. And what did cutout do? Okay, this is the red line is last year's cutout. You had all those sales and cutout took off. Then you had a lack of cutout sales, right? Lack of volume and cutout came down. Now, the, just that export sales report, so the cutout weekly export report, we did have our biggest number at 1,100 loads sold last week since October. So that's the biggest number we've had since October. Still isn't what we were seeing in October, but it's the biggest number we've had since October. You know, in all those October sales that we had on the export sales report, Look what happened to exports in November. You had the sales in September and October, and boom, you had your best November export sales of all time, right? Exports shipments of all time. So that's something definitely to watch that a lot of people aren't aware of is the 640 report as far as an indicator of export sales. I'm going to skip a couple here because I think I'm falling a little bit behind. Um, National negotiated base cash, okay, this is a sore point for a lot of people. Um, this highlights the difference between what we're experiencing now and PED, right? Who in here can tell me how much pork production was down in 2014? Pork production, not slaughter. In 2014 with PED. Like 14% of the ships, 1.7. It was the, the problem in 14 was a lack of pigs, right? It wasn't a lack of pork because you, you all had the barn space 
to grow those pigs up to record levels. This is a much different problem. There are no lack of pigs in the United States, right? We know that. There is a global pork shortage. It's a different problem. It doesn't mean we're not going to rally. If we rally, though, it's for a different reason, right? 2014 was a shortage of pigs. Those, that shortage of pigs does not exist today. We have an excess amount of pigs, right? And that's where you're getting this big spread between cutout and base cash, right? Pork is doing well. Pork is selling well. We're getting record exports. But we've still got all those pigs we've got to get to the packer, right? And so that's created this record large difference between cutout and base cash. And it continues today. That's the CME index. CME index is about, oh, $3 above last year at this point in time. Not exactly what we were hoping for, right? That's the cutout minus the CME index, again, at record levels. So switching gears a little bit and getting into the structure of the futures market, okay? We call this hog cash versus futures. All you're looking at here is the blue line is the average of the CME index over the last 10 years. I've excluded 14 just because 14 overweights it, okay? So the blue line is the average over the last 10 years for the CME index. These dashes are where the corresponding futures are trading. You know, so for instance, August futures are trading at 86. At least when I did this, they were trading at 86.80. They, they did bump up a little bit today. October futures are at 75. You know, so even though, what I want you to take out of this chart is that even though the index is $10 below, currently $10 below the average, the 10-year average, right? These futures out here are trading above the 10-year average. It starts to show you a little bit of the optimism that's, that's still in the market relative to history. And when you look at this from a different view, so this would be August futures minus the CME index. August futures currently trading at $26 above the index. That difference is the highest it's been in the last 10 years at this time of year. Again, just highlighting that the, the futures market currently is optimistic relative to where that index is today. Good news here, okay? The, the market's hanging in there, and the market is, like I showed you, is still optimistic. And that's what, without the influence of the funds. The funds, you add, the funds are basically flat hog futures, which would be, you could make an argument, would be the most bearish they've been in the last 10 years, looking at this chart. Tied with a couple other years, right? They have a lot of ammunition, the funds do. And if there's a reason to start buying these hog contracts and buying the hogs, the funds have a lot of ammunition to bid those, those futures up, right? I mean, if you consider about 70,000 contracts, they're, they're ammunition, if you will. You know, that could really lead, if there's a reason to rally the hogs, that could really lead to a big rally, if there's that reason. The one thing that I don't think a lot of people have seen is this here, okay? So these are commercial long positions. These would be long hedgers out there. You know, let, let's say you're a processor and you've sold forward, you've sold carcasses all the way out through July to China. What are you gonna do? You're gonna come in and buy those futures, right? On the hogs to lock in that margin as best you can. Commercial long positions are currently long about 70,000 contracts. That's double the previous record high for this time of year. You know, look at that red line from last year as they were selling. This, that's one, one reason to be buying these futures, is if you're selling the, if the processors are selling carcasses out in the future, you buy those hog contracts to protect, right? And you can see how much they bought going into the end of the year. They continue to be long 70,000. That's something to watch, okay? If you start seeing that come down significantly, one reason that could be happening is that sales to China are drying up a little bit, okay? So what do we look like? Um, this is third quarter margins. This is a demonstration operation, um, but it's, it, it, it holds pretty true for throughout the industry. Margins currently in this operation, fictitious operation, are at $12.73 per hundred weight, which is at the 82nd percentile, okay? All that means is that 82% of the time, 
in the last 10 years, third quarter margins have actually been worse than where they are today. And only 18% of the time have they been better. We're dealing with pretty good margins out there still. It doesn't feel like it necessarily because of the way the market has come down from its highs. But the margins out there are very, very good right now, historically. That gives you a 10-year view of third quarter margins, OK? That purple line across there would be the 80th percentile. So you can see how about 20% of the noise is above that line, right? Each line here going back a different color would be a corresponding year. So you can see, again, just give you a perspective on how good the margin is today. It's not what we had last spring on the spike rally. Certainly isn't, right? But it's still a good margin historically. And that's the last five years for third quarter margins. You know, the third quarter margin today at 1292 for this operation is $4 better off than any previous year in the last five at this time of year. You know, so if you don't have protection on out there, I showed you how optimistic the futures market is, right? I'm showing you how good the margin is historically. It might be a good idea to start protecting some of that margin and start putting in some floors just in case this whole thing with the exports doesn't pan out to the extent that it needs to to soak up all our extra production. Pause real quick for any questions. Germany. How far in advance will we see that happening to the futures? Like, when will the reaction time? Sorry. You're good. How far in advance will we see? Well, how far, like, when will the futures react? Yeah. Like, when will you see them reacting to this announcement that swine flu has ended up in, in, in Germany? Germany. Yeah. Germany would be a big one, yeah. Or, or Spain would yeah. be another big one. They would, they would react immediately. So we would see the, the, the futures market starting to react? I would imagine. That, that would be my guess. You'd never know how it's going to react, right? Mm -hmm. It's a market. But my, my guess is that you would see an immediate reaction. Mm -hmm. They've been up over 100 today. Would they be up over 100? They've been up about 100 Well, uh, all right. So let's say we soak up all, let's say we were the ones that got lucky enough to soak up all of Germany's exports to China. I'm not sure mm -hmm. that would give you $12 bounce, right? That, that's a, you know, like I showed you, I mean, we need another 200 million to account for just to get to the USDA projection, just to break even if their production estimate is accurate. But it is a market. It can go wherever it wants to go. And I would imagine there'd be a pretty healthy bounce. You know, guess, I'm guessing into the mid nineties, pure guess. So, but I think it would happen pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, seasonal. So this is a seasonal chart of third quarter margins. And as you can see, we're right here today. It's kind of a, a faint line, if you can make it out. You know, we're at a pretty good spot seasonally, but it does tend to get better here over the next couple months. I did exclude 14 from this calculation because 14 out just gives it too much weight. You know, if it excludes 14 from the equation, the top spot on margins for third quarter in the last 10 years has been right around the middle of April. So if you do see some strength in the market, and we did see a little bit today, right? If you do see some strength in the market, again, you know, I would, I would be thinking about adding some coverage. It doesn't mean you have to lock it in, and we're going to see that in a second, but, but adding some coverage to be prudent about the margins that are available makes a lot of sense to us. So we're going to get into a little bit of option theory. I'm, I'm going to keep it real high level, um, not, nothing too advanced. But there is a lot of optimism out there from producers, and you're still hearing it a lot when you're reading articles and whatnot, right? So, so what kind of position can you put on if you, if you want to be prudent and protect today's margins, right, but still be able to participate in higher prices? So in order to do that, I want to look at option pricing, okay, to see what's the best available strategy out there. So let's start with the futures themselves. These are October futures, which is obviously half of the third quarter production, okay? October futures right now are trading at 75.50. It's the highest they've gone out in the last five years, meaning the highest that they've expired in the previous four. 69. They're also, just today, they're also $5 above the previous five-year high. 
So, so 75 for October, at least in the last five years, is a pretty darn good price, right? This is option pricing. Okay, again, I don't want to get into the, the nitty gritty and the, and the advanced terms and all that, you know, but option pricing is dependent upon five variables. Four of them are known by everybody. Things like where the futures are trading, where, uh, when, is, when is expiration, right? Is it a call or a put? Things of that nature. The one thing that you're guessing on when you're, when you're looking at option pricing is implied volatility. So implied volatility, in other, term, in other words, is option pricing. The higher implied volatility goes, the higher the prices of options. Okay, that's all we're saying by, with that term. This is, op, this is the option pricing for October. Option pricing is at its high as well, going back over the last 10 years. It's currently sitting at about a 29% implied volatility. All that matters is, you can see here, it's at its highs. However, these are, this is that implied volatility for each strike within the October contract. So right here is the at the money. That's where the futures are trading at 75. You can see here the 86 call, the 84 and 86 call is a lot cheaper than the downside puts, right? So what could you do to take advantage of that? Well, you could sell futures at 75. And if you're happy with that, you just leave it alone. Right? Maybe do that on 20% of your production or 30% or 40%. But if you want to keep that upside open, you could buy a call up here that would effectively do that. Okay? So that's the strategy we're going to look at. So if you were to sell futures at $75.50 and buy an 86 call for $3.35, that would open up the upside. Okay? So that if the market rallies, and you're losing on that future, that call will gain value as long as that happens in the next, call it two to three or four months, okay? The one thing you're chasing on options is decay because as time goes on, those options are gonna decay in value, right? But if we, if we were to do this strategy and we take October futures at 75 half and buy the call for 335 and then fast forward the time to April 21st, with all else being equal, that call is still going to be worth 225. Okay, so so you can hold this call for three months. Hopefully, by then we're going to have some better clarity as to the trade deal and its impact on our exports. We'll have better, more clarity on our exports to Mexico and if they're improving due to USMCA, as well as Japan. Right. So three months, you're going to be a little bit more informed than you are today. So if you wanted to protect that futures price at 75, you could sell that future and go ahead and buy that call. And yeah, with all else being equal, if the market doesn't move, that call is going to decay to $2.25. So for $1.10 between now and April, you can keep that upside open for yourself if, if you're optimistic about the market. Any questions on that? Yes, sir. So, when you were looking at the implied volatility a minute ago and the skew, you could have just bought a put, but instead you elected with selling a, the futures and buying a call, so synthetically buying a put. Correct. Are you saying that buying the call, you get more bang for your buck than just going out and buying the put? It, it, it's more... It is the same thing as buying this, this position here, and you're going down the road of advanced, but the, this position here is the exact same thing in the end as buying an 86 put. Okay? However, to buy that 86 put is going to cost you up front an awful lot of money. Right? So it just depends on your cash flow. It's going to behave in the end the same exact way as an 86 put, but this way you can sell a future and you can buy a much more reasonably priced call for 335, much cheaper than that put that's probably going to cost you, well, I know what it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you $14 to buy that put currently. So great question, but it, it, it helps from a cash flows perspective as well as from a mental perspective, 
um, when, you, when you have the market moving higher, you're going to have a profit in that call that you can take, right, that you can put against those futures you sold. So it makes the next adjustment a little bit easier. Good question. How are we doing on time? Okay, any more questions? Okay, so just to, to summarize uh, today's talk, um, we looked at fundamentals, and the, the key on the fundamental side of things is that supply is going to remain very cumbersome for 2020, right? We looked at the China ASF and exports, and, and that really does remain the X factor through this whole thing. We didn't even talk about Vietnam, Philippines, South Korea, and all of that, you know, that could add to exports and, and could help increase that export total, that 800 million increase. Market structure, you know, two things I would say that, that a lot of people don't look at that I would start looking at would be those weekly cutout reports, especially the export one, as well as that commercial long hedger's position. That gives you a couple indications of what could be happening as far as the export market on a more timely basis than the actual export numbers you get, okay? As well as the fact that futures are still pricing in an optimistic outlook relative to history. Um, margins are at the, fi the five-year high um, from a seasonal perspective, okay? Third quarter margins are $5 higher than they have been in the past at this time of year. And then strategies con to consider just what we went over, you know, a short future long call position if you wanted to protect today's current price but keep that upside open for yourself. Questions? Okay, well, again, oh, go ahead. So, so help us with a little uh, thought process on, the, on what we can do on basis. Yeah. So one problem with basis that is a side effect of more cutout based contracts is that if you're on a base cash contract instead, the CME index is now being impacted to the tune of about 30 to 35 percent of cutout. So when you get these big packer margins and cutouts way up here and, and cash is way down here, the cutout is keeping that CME index elevated and, and therefore keeping the futures elevated. Does that make sense to everybody? How do you mitigate basis risk? Historically, what you've done is you sell the front month future and you buy this next future and use a future spread in order to do so. It's called a bear spread. With the theory that if cash is very weak, right, that front month future is gonna come down quicker than the back month future. So if you have bad basis, that'll help mitigate a portion of it, right? If not all of it, that's the past. What's that? Yes. That does not solve the first concern I just brought up, though, which is the fact that if you are on a base cash contract, it's very difficult to make up that difference currently. Now, if the packer margins tighten, basis is going to get a heck of a lot better for those, for those producers. Okay? It's a function of the, of, the, of the function of the packer margins, packer margins being cut out minus cash. Make sense? Anybody else? Well, I really appreciate you uh, hanging out as long as you did, and um, good luck with the weather and getting home. And if you have any questions, feel free to pull me aside, okay?